Okay, now for our interview with Teresa Rodriguez. Give us a quick snapshot of pre-NAFTA Juarez versus post-NAFTA Juarez. Pre-NAFTA Juarez uh, was a typical border town, typical border town, as you see many, you know, along our southern border. Um, you know, you had, uh, you typically had a lot of Americans who could cross over. It was cheap to come and go. A lot of people would go there, enjoy the bars and drinking and uh, a weekend of partying or going and shopping for whatever it be, whether it be the uh, the pottery and some of the, you know, the artist that makes things down there, but a lot of it was, it was a party town. It was a good place to visit if you wanted to enjoy, disconnect, cross the border, come back, do things you probably would never do in the United States. The NAFTA uh, comes along, this was in the early 90s, when this free trade agreement was signed between Mexico, Canada, and the United States. And it was best basically um, to build these huge factories, th these assembly plants south of the border because it was cheaper, labor was a lot cheaper. So what happens? The infrastructure of Juarez was not ready for this onset. All these people who lived in Mexico and heard about these factories opening, and by the way, the factories were operating 24 hours around the clock. And unlike the United States and Canada, where you have age restrictions on who you hire, you could basically hire 15 year olds to work on this assembly line. So what happens, you have all these people who are migrating to the border. Many of them are very poor. They're looking for an honest living. They're looking for jobs. Their kids were working, their wives were working, the husbands were working, and they lived, many of them couldn't afford to live in Juarez. So they were living in shanty towns. All these shanty towns just started to spring up where not even buses would get there. They weren't paved roads. So they were taking public transportation. Kids were going to school, coming out of school, going to work at the factory. And then the factory, they, they would finish up their whatever time it was, whether it be seven o'clock at night, whatever, eight, nine, 10, and they would have to get a bus back to come home. What, what were some of the bigger factories? What companies? You know, I'd have to go back. I know, I, I to be honest with you, I, I didn't get into that as far as mentioning, but there were American factories there and that's all out there. You can right. look them up. I mean, I mean, but ma major U.S. companies. There were major U.S. companies out there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there were other companies as well. You had a big, Juarez is home to a big petroleum company as well. And what made this so fascinating is that a lot of the people who came, not only were they hardworking, but um, they trusted. I mean, they, they, these were just, these were not criminals. These were innocent people said, well, if I was making this in my town, now I can go there and make this living and be able to give my family a better way to live. And when they realized, oh, their kids can work, their wives can work, something else happened because women started to work. Remember that we're talking about a machista society. Let's not go too far from that all of a sudden women started to bring home money. And some of these men didn't like that. So there was some abuse that started to happen within the family circle because all of a sudden women were not just the ones taking care of kids and taking care of the house. They were also working and they felt they had something to say about how money was spent and how things were done. So that created a little bit, that, that's one of the issues that came up. The fact that for the first time, women felt they had a voice and they had a say. They were working and bringing home money. Um, then on top of it, you had a lot of these young girls um, who, when the bus, the bus would drop them off. And again, they would live very far away. And if, if it was late at night, they had to walk to get to the shanty town to get to their little, I wouldn't even call them. I mean, I went to these places and they were basically all sharing electricity. You would see the power lines connected from one power pole to this other little hut and this other little hut. And they were using metal, metal as a roof and whatever pieces of concrete and old rugs as floor. And they would cook outside. So you're talking about dire poverty, dire poverty. And that's how they were living. But they were making a better living than they were wherever they were before in the past. So this was all good. What were they getting paid per hour approximately? Oh my God. Um, you know, I, again, I wrote this book 14 years ago. So it, it, you're, I don't recall, but it was minimum wage. I mean, they, they were making pennies compared to what 
an American would have made in a week. Yeah. I think when I was doing my research, I think I saw something around $4 an hour approximately. Is that yeah, sound they, around? They were, you know, it was so minimal. But for them, it was more than they ever had than they ever than they ever made. So for them, you've got to put it in the context of who's making it and where they're making it. Yeah. And how they felt that how they could afford to buy a little truck or they could, you know, their their kids were going to school, they could buy some clothes for them. Um it, it was a new beginning for them. And for me, it was a sign of hope. But well, then, and, and, uh, sorry, I, I, excuse me. I, I was just going to say that on paper, mm -hmm. this idea sounds actually pretty good to me. Uh, the, 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 this idea of having U.S. factories in Mexico because there's a lot of... Uh, demand there's a lot of labor down there a right. lot of them want to come to america but there's a big contingency that doesn't think that we should be taking that much immigration in so the idea of providing <clears throat> u.s factories in mexico for them sounds like a pretty good idea it, yeah and and in theory however when you bring all these factories in and you're operating 24 hours a day and the city is not equipped for this onslaught of people, then there is a problem. There's more traffic. There are not enough um, police officers to be able to manage uh, any reports of crime. Um, the system was overloaded. There are not enough schools. So schools have to, had to start operating on double shifts. It was no longer seven to two or eight to three. Now we had the morning shift and then we had the afternoon shift, which meant those kids were leaving sometimes at eight, nine o'clock at night which is extremely late. And many times they didn't have someone there waiting for them because these people couldn't afford to get in a car and go pick them up. They had to rely on public transportation. So yeah, it's a wonderful, in paper it looks great, but in theory, it didn't work because of everything else that happened as a result of this, of the poor planning. The city planners just didn't envision that everyone would wanna to go to Juarez and become part of this experiment. Um, and unfortunately, I feel that it took its toll in terms of human lives, especially young women, uh, even teenagers, because all of a sudden they became victims of crimes of opportunity. Many of these women who were initially killed, many of them disappeared. Some of their bodies were never found, but those bodies that were found were found out in the desert some, somewhere where I guess they were left to die thinking that no one would ever find them or they would be eaten by the coyotes and these other animals uh, out there in the desert. Um, and that I think was the biggest, it was a human toll that we never thought you know, would take place. And it all goes back, as I said, border towns traditionally violent, traditionally. But all of a sudden this became Dodge City. You had cartels moving in, you had corruption, police corruption, you had um, authorities who were overwhelmed, who really couldn't deal, were not equipped to deal all the crimes that were being reported. Um, and then you also had ineptitude on their part. They just didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to do. And you had impunity. If you had money and you had power, unfortunately, and the machista part of it also comes into the equation, you could get away with murder. And they did get away with murder. When I first started to look at this story in the late 90s, I remember I was just searching for stories on the wires as to what to do for our show, Aki Ahora on Univision, which is a news magazine show. And I started reading this article and I'm going, almost 200 women dead in Juarez, which is right across the bridge from El Paso? How come I haven't heard about this? And I said, wow, if this were happening in Canada, we'd hear about it. We, it, it would be in the headlines. And for heaven's sakes, here in this country, every time a woman disappears or a person or a baby or a child, whoever, you get an Amber Alert on your phone or you hear about it. And too many women were disappearing. And when I started to make phone calls, the more phone calls I made, the more I said, this, this is just beyond, I cannot conceive that this is happening. Just the cross. I mean, you could walk across the bridge in El Paso and get to Juarez. It's not like you're talking about somewhere in a foreign country that's you know, miles and miles away from us. No, you could walk to Juarez. Um, and that's how it all started. And when I got there and I started to see what was happening, and what surprised me, Jim, is that many of these women who first disappeared, uh, when their families would go and report them to the authorities, what they would get from authorities was, well, 
I bet you she's out with a boyfriend. No, my daughter doesn't have a boyfriend. Well, how do you know that? I know my daughter. She doesn't have a boyfriend. And she would come straight from school or straight from work home. Something's amiss. Something's wrong. And remember, they didn't have cell phones to be able to to call. That was not. These were poor people. Uh, And then the next question that authorities would pose, well, what was she wearing? Was she wearing a mini skirt? How was she dressed? Was she dressed provocatively? What has that got to do with it? Has nothing to do with it. And then we said, no, my daughter was wearing jeans. She was wearing a white top, you know, and even if they were, had a mini skirt on, what difference does that make? And this all falls under the equation of machismo. Well, she was looking for trouble. And they'd say, no, you know what? She'll show up. Why don't you wait a few days and then come back? But I'm sure she'll show up. Poor. They had nothing. Where else are they going to go? They went to the authorities. And their daughters would not show up. And if they were lucky, the bodies were found later on. And at the beginning, um, people thought it was a serial killer because there was a certain, I would say, there, there was a certain woman or young lady that they were looking for. She was petite, uh, she was slender, brown hair, almond shaped eyes. Um, so everyone in Water said, oh my God, there's a serial killer loose. And also when they started to find some of these bodies, the way that the body had been left, the way that the clothes were folded next to the body, there was a pattern. But then all of a sudden there were copycats. They started, the police officers shared with the media, you know, we think it's a serial killer because they're leaving things in this fashion, in this fashion, in this fashion. That was out there. So all of a sudden there was a change. So the question is, is the serial killer changing his modus operandi or are there copycats? I seem to think there were copycats because all of it. Because grand total, remind Mm -hmm. us, how many women are we talking about here? Girls slash women. Well, when I started to research it, it was a little under 200. By the time the book was published, it was about 450. That we know of. That we know of. And that's just in Juarez. And again, I- Over over what time period? That was uh, about 10 years, over 10 years. And I'm sure the numbers were much more elevated. Um, And we never really knew about it. In fact, these murders were not classified as femicides until 2015. So sometimes they were classified, oh, it was incest or it was domestic violence. Um, And yes, there, there were cases of incest, of domestic violence, but there are many other cases that we'll never even, what well, we really will never know, you know, the, the answer. I have my, um, I guess I would say that they, you know, after everything I did, all the investigations and all the people I talked to and the ineptitude and the stories that, 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 that I heard the authorities tell me, um, I have a, uh, my own idea of what may have happened. And although right now, that is not happening in Juarez, be it the pressure from the press, be it the fact that other cartels have come in and now cartels were fighting over their own territory and over power. Um, also, I think that the Me Too movement recently has sparked or has given women a little more strength in numbers and they feel that they can unite and go out there and demand justice. Although if you look at Amnesty International, their reports were say, will say that violence against women, not only in Mexico, but in many Latin American countries are at an all time high, especially when these women go out there and denounce, you know, gender violence. Just, I'm talking to you this month, this is March. March is Women's History Month. March 8th was Women's International Day. That was the day that many women in many countries were marching to demand justice for these women, right? In Mexico City, what happened? The new president who said, oh, I believe in women's rights, I will stand for their rights. He put up barriers around the palace and around some memorials before the march. Some of the marches got very violent. And in the end, you know, women were arrested, they were beaten, but in the end, they did put up in front of that palace, in front of that barrier, the names of so many women that they feel have not received justice. So I think women are actually getting a little, they're a little braver because they feel that there is some strength in numbers, but again, history repeats itself. And 
what bothers me, and I was looking back at, as I said, this book, I went back and that was actually published in 2007. When I interviewed uh, these families uh, in 2006, 2005, and even before that, I remember the sister of one of the girls who was slain told me, and she had become very vocal and she was organizing women's groups. And she said, that is I fear for my life because I don't know if the next step I take outside my home will be my last. That was 14 years ago. And this is the same sentiment that exists today in Mexico and many other Latin American countries. Women are scared. Women don't trust the authorities. Women don't know who to trust. And although, the, although these leaders say, we're with you, we're going to support you, we're going to condone the violence, it's not happening. It's not happening. So it's very sad that although, as I said, these murders might have stopped, but the violence against women has not. And that to me was eye-opening when, you know, I, I was in Mexico two years ago during a woman's march. And I, I said, I can't believe I'm witnessing this. I can't believe. When I wrote the book, a lot of people were shocked because they'd never heard about these murders. Well, why didn't they hear about them? Again, I say, if it was in Canada, if this were happening in Canada, it would have been all over the news here. But it was Mexico. Number one, the victims are poor. Nobody cares. They know, these perpetrators know, that these families do not have the money to come in and hire an attorney who's going to fight to find out what really happened. Crimes of opportunity. They're walking late at night. They're by themselves. The majority of these young girls, they trusted. They, they came from a normal family. Somebody comes up, say, hey, let me give you a ride. Okay. That was the last time they saw them. Or, hey, let me get you, let me, I'll get, hey, you like, the, I like, you like those shoes? I'm going to buy you those shoes. No, 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 I can't accept a gift. They start to befriend them. They buy them a pair of shoes. Next thing you know, they don't see them ever again. There's a lot here. There's a lot here. And I think that uh, it's a combination of factors. Um, I interviewed some people who are no longer with us. One of them was an Egyptian chemist who worked at one of these companies. And um, he was arrested. He did have a criminal record here in, in the States, specifically in Florida, abusing women and um, some other charges. But he always said to me, I did not kill any of these women. He says, but I'm the perfect scapegoat. I work at a factory. I know the hours these women come and go. Uh, yep, when I drink, I can get a little violent, but I have never killed a woman. Well, he was arrested. He was charged with the murder. First it started, they accused him of half a dozen or a dozen murders, then it came down to one. And again, the evidence just didn't stack up, but he was sentenced. And he never made it out. He told me, I know at least part of who's responsible, some people responsible for these murders. But I'm afraid I may not live to talk about it. And I, and I said, tell me. And he said, all I can tell you is that one of them is a police officer and he's short and he has, he shows up at all these crime scenes. And that's why these women are all of short stature and petite, you know, that's the women he likes. The other two are very powerful men. I believe they're into the cartels. And there may be other people who are also very powerful, who may be working at some of these factories, who may be leading a double life here in Mexico. It says, remember, these women are disposable. You use them, and then you get rid of them, and you leave them in the desert. And I'll never forget that. And you know what? He died. He died uh, while under custody at a hospital, a state hospital. They said it was cirrhosis of the liver and hepatitis C. We don't know. No. Do, you, do you believe him that he was not involved in any of the killings? I, I do think he, um, we obviously know he had a violent record when it came to women, especially in the States and Florida. But they tried to associate him to a gang the rebels, they called them, some of which are still doing time. And supposedly from inside the jail, he was paying them to go out and kill women. Interestingly enough, he was in jail. He said, how can I possibly be paying these people? I don't even know who these rebels are. And the crimes continued. They, then they rounded up all these guys, all these gang members, 
And the head of the gang members, who I interviewed as well at jail, in jail, and he said, I was tortured into signing something that said, confessing basically that I was doing this. I've never done, I, I don't know these women. I've done other things, but not these women. I'm not responsible for the murders of these women. But although all these people were behind bars, the crimes continued. Does that make sense? The crimes continued. So I don't know that Sharif, Sharif, he was not a saint, but I don't really think he murdered these women. And the one person who he was accused of murdering, the evidence never really coincided, but he was sent to jail. And then there was an attorney I interviewed who was defending, oh, let me back it up a little bit. Because some of these companies were coming under fire for not protecting these women who were working there, they decided that they were going to hire uh, bus drivers and these services, right? To shuttle services, bus services, so that when these women left the factory, they could at least be transported downtown where they could in turn transfer on to another bus that would take them as close as possible to these shanty towns. Problem is, they didn't do their homework. So um, some of these services, shuttle services, were private. The majority were all private. And they didn't do the background checks on who these people were driving these buses. So there was another set of accusations against two bus drivers when they found eight more bodies that were buried in a cotton field that was in town. This was no longer in the outskirts. These were in town and they were directly across from the Association of Maquiladoras, which is the assembly plants, the, uh, the base office that represents. I always looked at it and said, hmm, this comes across as a message because now the murderers were getting bolder. The bodies were being dumped, not out there. They were being dumped in a cotton field right in the middle of the city across the highway from the association that represents all of these assembly plants. That we know of, eight bodies were found. We don't know if there were more there, but these two bus drivers were picked up and said, you killed these two women, these women, these eight women, and they said, no, we didn't kill anyone. Um, they went before the press and they said again that they were uh, tortured into signing confessions. Um, they, they showed some of their bruising. I interviewed the wife of one of them and she said, I don't know when my husband would have been able to kill, much less you know, molest or kill because I worked on them on the route six days a week. We rested Sunday, but I worked with him six days a week. He was always with me. These are just scapegoats because the violence continues and the police need to say, we got the killers, we got the killers, but the violence continued. And it was when they arrested those two bus drivers and they had alibis that all of a sudden the victims' families started to also question, do they really have the killers or not? That, that, that one of these bus drivers actually died in jail he was taken to have some kind of an emergency medical procedure that his wife said she never even knew about. And he died. And she said, if it was an emergency, I mean, why didn't, why wasn't I told? The other one, I believe he might've gotten out because the wife was still, you know, she had hired an attorney and they were working on getting him out. That attorney was murdered in the middle of the day in Juarez prominent attorney who I interviewed as well. And when I interviewed him, I said, do you fear for your life? Because we've seen too many people who are raising questions about who the real perpetrators here are. And he said, yes, I fear for my life. But I studied law because I believed in justice. And I'm not gonna let my guard, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let this go. What's happening is not right. Um, before I finished writing the book, I was very sad to hear that he, uh, it was lunchtime, he was with a friend in his truck and there was a Ford truck with New Mexico license plates that came up next to them, opened fire, semi-automatic weapons. He was killed, his friend was not. When I asked the city for, they have cameras, it's an intersection. Well, let's see the cameras. What do the cameras show? You can identify, you know, it was New Mexico plates. I mean, oh no, that day, that particular camera was aimed looking in the other direction. And I said, okay, how about the ones down the street? 
No, they weren't working. Oh, so on that day, they weren't working or aimed in the wrong direction. And this is the kind of roadblock that I would hit every single time I would try to have, you know, ask a follow-up question. That's just one example. And what what information did he have that would cause someone to... He was fighting for, he was fighting for the bus driver because he said, there's no evidence. The wife has been with him the whole time. The guy has never committed any kind of crime. But yeah, and, and we could see, we could see the burn marks. Um, we could see the, the torture. So you do believe that he was killed because of the work that he was doing on I behalf do, of the bus driver? I do believe. And his colleague was killed months before. His so that tells us. On a similar story, on a similar story, on a case. And he had gone outside of Juarez um, to visit someone, um, a, a client. And on the way back, he said that somebody started to pursue him. And actually, he was on the phone with his father. And he's saying, somebody's following me. And then they started to shoot at him. And his father said, oh, my God, son, please, where are you? Where are you? They shot him. And later on, it was the police. They said that they had mistaken him for drug traffickers. Really? An attorney who goes into the municipal court all the time, who was very well known in Juarez, all of a sudden you mistook him for a drug trafficker, but he was shot and he was killed. And that was months before, which is why I had asked this attorney, do you fear for your life? There was a pattern. Anyone who spoke up, anyone who was trying to defend the rights of these people who were being accused that many felt were scapegoats, um, were either threatened, had to leave the city, or were murdered. The head criminologist on the case, Oscar Maynes, who said to me, I have to leave. Uh, I know we found eight bodies at the cotton field, but that's as many as we were allowed to look for. There may be more there. Um, He fled. He came to the States. There was a woman who was a criminologist who was working in, she was a forensic scientist. She still is, I'm sure. And she was, she would um, recreate from the skulls and the bones and whatever was found in the desert, a face. And then that would be published in the local paper and she would, and they would say, do you know this girl? And that's how fun, some families came forward and said, that looks like my daughter. And I remember she also left, she also left because she was saying, this doesn't add up. I mean, you're doing this, you're doing. So you have, and you had a revolving door of district attorneys who were fired because they were so incompetent. I remember being, doing an interview and my producer, all of a sudden my producer came up to me and said, they found the body right in the middle of the city. And I said, you know what? I said, you go over there with one of the cameras, I'll stay here with the other cameraman and do this interview. She got there and I was just finishing up and she called me, she goes, you're not gonna believe this. It turns out it was a domestic dispute, but the way they're walking all over the crime scene, they're just destroying evidence. And I put it up. I, I, I did include that video in one of my stories. So for, and this was a new, um, this was a new investigator who had just come in under the district attorney's office. And she was telling me it was a woman. I'm going to change things. I'm going to be so much better. We're going to protect the crime scene. We're going to do that. We're going to do this. And, and I came into her office and I said, let's just look at this little video. Is this how you protect the crime scene? You walk all over it? Because that's not how we do it in the States, but maybe I'm missing something. She couldn't answer. She was fired. So I, I lost track of how many people I interviewed in power who either were fired, uh, those who were questioning what was really going on and who the real perpetrators were who were murdered, the others who had to leave Mexico, and the other ones whose families were threatened. And they took these threats very seriously. And as a matter of fact, I haven't gone back in years because of threats. So the way you're describing things, I mean, it seems to me uh, that it all points to the cartels being involved. You know, I think it's a combination of, at the time, I think it was a combination of corruption. I think it was a combination of some very powerful and wealthy people um, who might have led a double life, who enjoyed having sex with these women and then had enough money to say, let's dispose of them, and who had the complicity of the, of the authorities. Um, and it, some of them, the last time they were seen, I know of one in particular, she was seen at a party for uh, one of the political um, 
political parties at the time that uh, it was a very exclusive party. She was seen at that party. Politicians, drug cartels, police officers, businessmen. I think it had to do with a little bit of each. Um, there, there were very powerful forces at work here. Enough so that they could do what they had to do. And these women were brutally murdered. I mean, brutally murdered. You're talking about not just rape, but uh, they, they were beaten. They would have one nipple pretty much just bitten off. Um, they were strangled, some of them, with their own shoelaces. And I remember one of the forensics uh, experts telling me that some of the victims still had sand underneath their nails, which meant that when they were left to die, they were struggling. They were struggling to get up because the sand was so deeply embedded underneath their nails. Um, it was very hard for me. You know, it was 10 years and I became so immersed in this whole story, a story that just wouldn't go away. It wouldn't go away. And I have colleagues who were in radio, who were in bars, who basically had to leave because once they started to question what was really going on, they received threats. And they said, not only will you be killed, we're going to get to you. And they knew we're going to get your sister. We're going to get your mother. We're going to get your wife. We're going to kidnap your kids. Too much information. And they left. They had to leave. So the, I, I took this all very seriously. Did, did the murders come to an end at some point? They did come to an end. Um, they did come to an end. I will say this. The book was never published in Mexico. That says a lot to me. So let's just talk about that real quick. It wasn't published. You, you tried to publish it there. Oh, yeah, because it was published in both languages, in Spanish and in English. Mm -hmm. However, it was never published in Mexico, in Spanish. Interesting, right? You would think Mexico would want to have a book about something that's happening in Juarez about the murders of these women, innocent women and, and young kids, young, young girls. Nope, never published. So that to me, when the published it, guess what? They're not interested in, in carrying the book there. I said, huh, maybe I shouldn't be surprised, but it says a lot when they're not interested. So that means, I mean, today's world, people get things on Amazon. So <clears throat> when right. you say it wasn't published in Mexico, you're saying, what does that really mean? That you they didn't money? buy the book to be distributed in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So book if you're in a bookstore, you're not going to see it. Not in Mexico. No, mm -hmm. obviously now it's different. Now we yeah. have the internet, we can get anything on Amazon. But at the time, that did not exist. So if the book wasn't coming, which is why I made it a point, not only that, I wanted to personally hand over these books to these families. Because let me tell you something, Jim, I'm a mom, right? So uh, you, you see these women and you would go to their homes and they would have that little room in the back with the teddy bear and uh, a prom picture or her quinceanera picture when she turned 15. And I would say, oh, I still see you have her room intact. And I remember them saying, yeah, in case she comes back. When she comes back, not in case so that when she comes back, she'll find it like, just like she left it. And that was like a dagger for me because I guess as a parent, you don't want to accept what could be the brutal truth. After a number of years, you obviously try, you know, you say, well, I guess she's not coming back or if they found remains. What, what is the Delta between how many were missing versus how many found? How many were missing is what we know of those that were reported. How many were found is what we know of what the government reported. So I guess we'll never really know the real truth because it's all coming from government sources. Right. I will say this, that there were plenty of um, women's groups. In fact, before all of this started, there wasn't even a shelter for battered women in Juarez. Esther Chavez Cano, who I also had... It was an honor I mean, to just get to know this woman. She has since passed. But she opened the first shelter, Casa Amiga. And she said, Teresa, it was, we were overwhelmed with women coming in, with their children. And then she became an advocate for these women. And this woman was about maybe 5'1 or something, petite, but she was 
a lion out there. I mean, she would go and talk to these people and say, you're an ept. You know, how can you do this? And, you know, and if these people are the ones killing these women, number one, why is it taking you so long to come up with viable evidence? And number two, why are the crimes continuing to happen? I said, nothing happened. There's more at work here. You just don't want to say the truth. And she, she said something to me. I'll never forget this, Jim. And she said, you know, in Paris, it's a disgrace to be a woman, but it is a crime to be a poor woman because poor women don't count. Women are treated as second, third, fourth, fifth, class citizens in Mexico, as in many Latin American countries. But if you're poor, living in Juarez, you just became a victim. Especially back in that, during that time, when I said there were so many forces at play, you had, you know, the the, the factories operating 24 seven, a city that wasn't prepared for all this influx. Um, And in a police department, um, machista's attitude. Uh, And then you also had the impunity the impunity that was happening. Hey, if you had money and you wanted to have sex with a girl and then, hey, get rid of this girl, chances are they might have, the authorities were gonna look another way. Hey, she's just another poor girl. But she had a name, she had a face, she had a family. And that was why to me, not only was it important to document some of their stories in the book, but to go back and personally hand these women the book, especially since the book wasn't going to be published in Mexico and say, you know what, at least your story's here. It's here. So I don't know if telling the story, I know that there were movies that that also came up. Um, Border Town was one of them with J-Lo. It didn't do that great, but I know it. This, the, the topic itself caught the eye of people beyond just journalists. So all of a sudden, the story was in many headlines. Um, I also think that maybe part of the reason why the murders died down the way they were happening is that other cartels started to come into the picture. So all of a sudden it was more important to keep or regain your power among the cartels, the feuding cartels, than to get these women and do whatever you were going to do with them and then dispose of them. That became secondary. And as a matter of fact, I remember one of the book signings I had I did not go to Juarez, number one, because it was not being sold there and because I feared for my life, but I stayed in El Paso and had a very long line. And I remember that um, there was this one young man who stood out because everybody that was coming in with the book, they knew who I was, they knew what I did at Univision, they followed me, uh, they knew about my stories, but this one man just, he was young, just didn't look like he fit in, comes up to me. And they all were saying, oh, could you sign my book? And could you also sign for my, my daughter? And I said, sure. This guy just came up, book in his hand, never asked me to sign it. He said, um, so who do you think is behind this? Narco, you know, narcotraficantes, the drug cartels. And I looked at him and I said, hmm, something inside me just said, let me think how I answer this. And I said, you know what? I, I think drug cartels are into moving their drugs and selling their merchandise. I don't think they're into killing women. If maybe some women got in the way somehow or other, well, I guess that happens. But I don't think this is their business. And he looked at me and goes, okay, thank you. And he he walked away and I said, hey, don't you want me to sign the book? And then he turned around and goes, oh, yeah. And I go, who? He goes, yeah, just put your name. He was sent. He was planted there. He was planted just to see what I was going to say. And And the reason I thought about it and I decided to answer that way was because the last time I was in Juarez, which was, I, I visited four years over the 10, 10 years, four times over 10 years. Um, we were staying at an American chain and that last day we were being followed. We were interviewing the wife of one of those accused bus drivers. And I, I said to my crew, I said, there are two well-dressed men wearing suits. I said, these guys are following us. My producer said, ah, oh, you're, you're making, I said, I'm not making that. Let's go and have coffee a minute downstairs. You're going to see these two guys. Sure enough, two guys walked in, sat like two tables down. So I said, all right, when we leave, we're going to see if we get followed. We got followed, came back to the hotel. And um, I said, listen, whoever these people are, I don't know if they were sent by the police. I don't know if they're part of a cartel. I don't know if they were sent by somebody wealthy just to follow us, but we're being followed. 
they knew exactly what we were doing. That night, at about 11 o'clock at night, I got a phone call and there was heavy breathing. They never said anything. And I kept saying, hello, hello, hung up. Two minutes later, another phone call, heavy breathing. Hello, hello, nothing. I called my cameraman. I said, are you up? He goes, yeah. I said, I need you to come to my room right away. Called my producer. Are you up? Okay, let's all meet in my room. Told him what happened. They were all scared, as, I, as was I. Went downstairs. Said, I need to speak to the manager. And the manager said, well, what, what's wrong? And I said, well, I had a call. It's like 11 something at night. Usually, you know, hotels are very strict about. And, uh, he, and they called in the receptionist and said, no, you haven't had a call from the outside. I said, interesting. I said, so the call I got originated from inside the hotel? They said, well, probably. And I said, but aren't you not supposed to transfer calls after a certain time? And the manager said, well, maybe they knew your room number. And I said, how would they know my room number? In the States, you don't give your room number out. Unless you know it. You know, you happen to be traveling with someone, you know what room they're in. He said, well, Miss Rodriguez, you know that you're working on a very delicate topic. I said, I beg your pardon? How do you know what I'm working on? I said, let me tell you something. We're American journalists. If anything should happen to us, this will not only be front page on all, you know, you name it, the New York Times, you name it, the Washington Post. My, this is going to be everywhere. I said, it would not behoove you. You're working for an American chain hotel. I said, to have anything happen to American journalists. He goes, well, no, I didn't mean it that way. I said, no. I said, just keep that in mind. Obviously, we didn't sleep. We ended up sleeping in one of the producer's rooms. We did not sleep. We barricaded that door. We called everybody back at, uh, at the network to let them know what's going on. And in fact, there was a late, no, there was a, my, before we got to the hotel that I said, we're definitely being followed and we were, my cameraman said to me, why don't we just leave tonight? And I said, no, because we've got to cross part of the desert to get to the airport. And I don't want us to be gunned down, confused for drug traffickers like they did that attorney. I said, we're staying put at the hotel. And the next morning we left very, very early. And I'll tell you something right now, when that plane just took off, it was like, okay, I'm not coming back to this place in a long time. And I haven't since, except for the time that I went to deliver the books. And I did it very quietly. And with someone who had worked on this project with me uh, in a personal car, and I stayed in El Paso, delivered the books, came back and flew to Houston. <laughs> so I didn't want to even sleep there. So is so, there yeah. any question in your mind when it comes to the Juarez police or all the police in Mexico for that matter, that they are under the effective 100% control of the cartels? I wouldn't say 100%. I think there are definitely, you know, some some good people out there. I just think that um, at this point in time, when this book was written, um, everything was ripe for, for these crimes to happen. You know, it was a combination of factors. And to this day, we know that there is a lot of complicity with some authorities, some authority figures, and the cartels, or organized crime, or mafia, whatever you want to call it. We know that crime is at an all-time high, and especially against women, despite the fact that women are uniting and, uh, and at least letting their voices be heard. Um, but I wouldn't say there was, it was all over, but it was enough so that more than, and th this is what we know of, more than 400 women were killed. And those are the ones we know of, because I'm sure there are many others we'll never hear about. Um, and I'd like to think that it's changing, but what just really gets to me is I remember that girl's words that day, and that was 14 years ago. I don't know if the last step I take outside my home will be my last one. And what I see today in all the headlines with all the violence against women for speaking up that they don't know, they don't trust. Who do we trust? We can't trust the police. We can't get into a police bar. We don't know what's going to happen. In Cancun, March 9th, there was a march. Not only were some women beaten, some of them were arrested, and at least one of them says that she was molested by a female police officer. So... And the March 8th march uh, of, of women that you're saying mm -hmm. the president guarded the city against, right? was there... What in particular were they protesting? 
they were looking out for women and for violence against gender related violence whether it be women whose uh, whose deaths whose assassinations have never been uh, who've never really been solved they were asking for justice and they were also demanding more equality um, and, and unfortunately, although the president has said, I hear you, I believe, you know, I'm going to do this, but the actions he took, you know, didn't really seem to support what he was saying. And then he said that the violence, that there was some violence, and I bet you that those were, what did he call them? I have, I've got the word. He says they were, uh, there was a political group that was in there that infiltrated the women and infiltrated this, and they're unhappy about what we're doing. You know, there's always an answer. There's always going to be. Oh, it was conservatives. That the, these were the group was infiltrated by conservatives who started the who started all the trouble. There's always going to be something, but unfortunately, as I said, we know of at least 450 women who paid the price, who were very young, many of whom who didn't really. They just wanted to lead a normal life. Some of them were barely 15. Some of them were kids, and the way they were murdered, just brutally murdered. There are crosses. I mean, if you go down to Juarez, you will still see those crosses for the, most, for the most part. And it's just a grim reminder of this very, very bloody and, and, um, and just horrible chapter in, in Juarez's history. Um, and again, we still don't know if any of those men who were arrested were guilty. We still don't really know and probably will never know. And we do know that some of them took um, whatever they did know to the grave. Do you think much on a macro level as far as how to solve this long running problem of Mexico of corruption, poverty, uh, the cartels, et cetera? I mean, wh wh what should the U.S. be doing oh or what God. should Mexico yeah. be doing? Yeah, the million dollar question. It's just history. It's just so many years, you know, of a machista society of treating women as second class citizens, of an ineptitude of police corruption of uh, the fact that a system is overwhelmed and doesn't really know how to deal uh, with all these crimes. Um, I don't have an answer. I'd like to think that by speaking up, women at least are starting to get noticed. And I'd like to think that these, the future generations of leaders will be a little more, you know, their minds will be a little different than this antiquated machista society. And they will say, well, wait a minute, women have as, the same rights as we do as men. You know, I'd like to think that there's got to be a change in how do we educate, especially men in Latin American countries, so that they respect women, you know, at the same level. And they have a regard for human life. What happened in Juarez, there was no respect for women. There was no respect for human life. I mean, can you imagine going to police station here and saying, hey, my daughter's missing and being told, Oh, she's probably with a boyfriend. Oh, she doesn't have a boyfriend. Oh, what was she wearing? Mini skirt? What? No. Come back in a few days. In a few days, she could be dead. And that's what continues to happen. Although there is now, you know, I believe it's 24, 48 hours where you have to, you know, if you don't hear from them, they continue, they, they will start that search. But yet so much can happen during that time. Do you think from the time you wrote the book to today, things are better or worse in Juarez? I think they're better in terms of the murders of women. I still think it continues to be an extremely, extremely violent city. But I, the, the fact that all of a sudden the topic got all this international attention probably helped quell the number of crimes against women. But unfortunately, the crimes against women continue to be at, at an all-time high. And not just in, in this border town, but in Mexico, in many Latin American countries, for that matter, even in Puerto Rico. And I know that this last year was tough because of the pandemic. And we saw how we had many more cases of domestic violence and things going on. But regardless of the pandemic, in general, crimes against women continue to be on the up and up. Listen, we've interviewed women who are prepared, who are school teachers, who had to leave their country, whether it be Honduras, whether it be Guatemala, uh, Nicaragua, and they went to, cross, to try to cross the border with their kids because they were being assaulted by their husbands. And they got to Mexico, they can't cross the border. One of these women we interviewed just a year ago, you know what she does at night? She's a prostitute. So during the day she's with her kids, she makes sure that she's back 
at home to be able to give him breakfast. And then when he goes to bed, she has someone take care of him. She goes, I hate to do this, but I can't find a job. So they're being denigrated to do this because she says, I can't find a job. I can't cross the border. And I can't go back home because my estranged husband is going to beat me or he's going to kill me and take my child. So women continue to live this life that you would, you would say, oh, my God, I can't, I can't believe this is happening. And it is happening. It continues to happen. And as bad as things are in Mexico, aren't they, in fact, probably even worse in the Central American countries? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Especially with the, um, all of the, um, the gangs. The gangs are, are and, these, and it's sad to say, many of them begin at a very young age. They're kids. And you see gang members who have killed a grandmother, an aunt. You know, they, they, it's ruthless, ruthless. They have no regard for human life. So because of the gang violence, you see a lot of people fleeing Central America. A lot of them are fleeing. And I know that we have a border crisis going on with all these children who are being held in detention centers. That's a whole other topic. But, you know, many are fleeing because they're also victims of gang violence. Or they've had a brother, a sibling. I interviewed a former gang member once who said I couldn't show his face. I had to distort his voice. I couldn't say where I had interviewed him. And he said, my brother was killed. I was next. If I didn't leave, I know that I was going to be killed. And he was resettled with some distant relatives. What happens? They don't connect. They don't know each other. They speak another language. They don't connect. They miss whatever they had back there. And so you have another set of problems that arises in this country. Um, and many of them turn, guess what? They turn in to gang violence because that's all they know. So they all of a sudden, they're at a school in the States where they're learning, they're learning English. But this camaraderie, this other gang member who's from El Salvador or wherever will come up and say, hey, I speak your language. I know you miss your family. I'm your family. Come and join me. And they end up joining a gang here. So it's a vicious, a vicious cycle that continues to repeat itself. And, and I say this, please don't, don't take it the wrong way. I know that most probably, I don't have the numbers. So I shouldn't say I know, but we have to be very, very, very careful about qualifying everyone in these border facilities as children by themselves. Some of them may already have a history of gang violence they're fleeing because they knew they were next. You've got to be very careful. Um, you've got to be careful about other people entering the country who may be posing as Latinos and are not, and who may have ulterior reasons for coming in. I interviewed someone years ago, and I don't want to say this person's name, a leader in a very a country that we are very friendly with who said the United States has got to watch its southern border. Because these people who are coming in and want to make an honest living, they're not the enemy. You got to be careful about other elements coming in. Yeah, and I think under this new policy, as long as you make the claim that you're seeking asylum, that yeah. uh, you're, you're, you're allowed in and then you're put on a waiting list for a trial that happens two years down the road. And again, I said, we can't generalize. It's always, you can never generalize, but we have to be very careful. And I think uh, what's happening there is, is an inhumane. It's inhumane. And the thought of how many families were separated. Um, but again, there's always two sides to a story. So we need to be able to do our homework and just be very careful. And all I can hope is that this topic of gender-based violence, and especially against women who are now starting to speak up, whether it be part of the Me Too movement that gave them the strength to come forward, whether it just be a sign of the times that they're fed up and they don't want to deal with this anymore. Uh, they want justice. Um, this has got to, uh, this, this violence has got to stop. And I do think that, I do hope, I have two sons and I've always taught them to respect women. And uh, I, would, I would hope that these future generations of men will grow up thinking that way too yeah. and think along the lines of the old machistas, machista attitudes. Um, also, there's a lot of poverty and poverty, you know, it, it never, when you're trying to make things neat and 
all of a sudden somebody offers you money and you know, that's how the corruption starts. That's how the corruption starts. Well, my couple, just to wrap up, I wouldn't mind getting your thought on a couple of radical ideas that I have that I've expressed on the show before, two of them. One, legalizing drugs. We're already seeing in America marijuana being legal and now experimenting mm-hmm. with others and things seem to be going okay. But the legalization of this trade would put the cartels out of business. So mm-hmm. that w- could make a significant change. Number two, even more radical, arguably, boy, it sure would be nice if somehow we could develop a relationship with Mexico where Mexico almost became or did become a territory of the U.S. I mean, the natural resources of Mexico, the potential of that country is through the roof. It just needs a non-corrupt government and it needs an end to the cartels. You, you 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 get a legitimate government in there and get rid of the cartels and it's Katie barred the door. Real estate prices are going to double, triple. So I, I know there's a couple of radical ideas, but it, it, you almost need something that radical to solve this. Yeah. And I don't know that this is going to get solved anytime soon. We've been through so many different leaders in Mexico. Um, I don't know that this is going to, to change because you're talking about centuries old thinking um, but, but but a historically I mean, corrupt no, and government. I, and, I, and I do think what you said, you have a point there when you talk about if you legalize drugs, the only thing, right now you have so much drug production going on in Mexico. It's all over the place, right? right. But who's the biggest consumer? We are. The United yeah. States is the biggest consumer. Yeah. We're just at, at, at fault. You know, what? if there is demand, there's going to be supply. It's right. supply and demand. It's a basic law of economics. So we also have to address the issues we have going on here. Right. But we've learned, we, we've tried that and, and getting people to stop taking drugs uh, doesn't happen. We, we tried prohibition to get rid of alcohol and it didn't, it didn't it's work. Right? So, so, so this new movement that you're seeing in America of, of going the other way on drugs, with starting with marijuana, could end up being the, um, the right solution. I mean, already the cartels have had to move on to different drugs because marijuana isn't where the money is necessarily anymore. Exactly. It doesn't make the money it used to. Yeah. So now that's caused problems with other types of drugs coming in. But the drugs will continue to come in. And you know what? The cartels will always find a way to bring it in. If it's not right. A, B, or C, it will be D, E, F. I mean, they're always going to find. And you know what's more? Uh, it's interesting how it will be in this little um, middle America neighborhood where you would never know that there's a drug connection there. And they're, they're, they're smart. They figure it out. And it's, it's happening. It happens every single day. So we had a great guest on who says that the, the yeah. largest grower of marijuana in California is the cartels. They're growing in California. <laughs> They've gotten smart and decided, why bring marijuana over the border when we can grow it right in California? And so they're growing it right under the noses of our uh, officials. Well, these are a lot of topics to tackle and uh, a lot to talk about. I'm sure you'll have uh, plenty of podcasts that you'll be able <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. Well, listen, I appreciate you having me on, especially during this month, which is so important for women. And I do want to end on one thought. Um, the um, One of the activists always said to me, the dead leave signs. They let us know what's happened. The question is, is anyone listening? So I'd like to think that more people will listen, more people will speak up, and hopefully someday we won't have to talk for almost an hour about violence against women and especially women who are trying to speak up and demand justice. So thank you so much. Thank you again to Teresa Rodriguez. And you can check out her book on Amazon, The Daughters of Juarez. Thank you to our producer, Michael Parker. Thank you all for listening. We'll be back soon with another episode of The Hidden Truth Show. Thank you for listening to The Hidden Truth Show with Jim Breslow. You can find us at hiddentruthshow.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Truth Show. Join us again next week for another episode of Hidden Truth Show with Jim Breslow.